I missed that. Welcome. My name is Julie Gunkelman. I'm the professional development coordinator for coordinator for AMATIC. Welcome to um, our webinar today, which is statistical statistical sampling methods with Jameis Parrott. The sponsoring committee is the Joint Committee of AMATIC and the American Statistical Association. Please note that the views expressed by the presenter are not necessarily the views of AMATIC. Commercial products mentioned by the presenters are not endorsed by AMATIC. Our uh, webinar sponsor is McGraw-Hill. Thank you very much for sponsoring our webinar series again this year. I'd like to read you a little bit about um, our presenter today. Dr. Jameis Parrott, PhD in statistics from Kansas State University, Manhattan, leads a data science and statistics team at uh, Bayer US Crop Science in St. Louis, Missouri, where he's worked for the past six years. Prior to working for Bayer, Dr. Parrott was an assistant professor at the University of Northern Colorado in Greeley, and later at Texas A&M University um, College Station. He currently serves as a member of the ASA slash NCTM Joint Committee on Curriculum and Statistics and Probability and is Vice Chair of the ASA Education Council. He attends the AP Statistics Reading each year and enjoys vis visiting local high school AP Statistics classes to talk with students about careers in statistics. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Jamie. All right, let's see if I can get my presentation up. We good? You see We're it? Good. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about uh, introductory topics related to sampling methods and then giving some examples. And uh, if you do have questions, please uh, text them in and we'll see how we can make sure that those get answered. So sampling is used to make statements about a larger group referred to as a population based on a subset of that larger group referred to as a sample. So the main goal of sampling is to select a sample that adequately represents all the individuals in the population. We have built rules and processes around that idea, but ultimately the goal is to represent the population as best as we can. If the chosen sample is representative of the population, then we can perform calculations or analytics on the sample and postulate that the results reflect what we would see if the calculations had been performed on the population itself. For example, we would expect that if we calculated a sample mean, that the, that value would be similar to the value of the population mean. But what if something goes wrong? What do you do if your sampling procedure produces a sample that is clearly not representative of the population, like a sample of students from a mixed gender school that ends up being all male or all females. Such a sample may not be a good representation of the population. In such a case, the researcher may choose to redo the sample using the same sampling method or may choose to redo the sample using a different sampling method, one that has a better chance of leading to a more representative sample. There are many different basic sampling methods that have been developed to help the researcher achieve that representative sample. And so here are a few of them. There's simple random sampling, stratified sampling, cluster sampling, and systematic sampling. But rather than thinking of these as individual and separate methods, consider them each as individual building bricks that work together to produce a sample. Very often researchers will use variations and combinations of these methods in their sampling design. So a simple random sample essentially involves numbering it's essentially like numbering each individual in the population and then selecting at random n individuals from the population to use in that sample. 
The letter N is often used to symbolize the number of individuals chosen for the sample. So in this case, N equals four. Consider another situation of a population that has natural groupings, like college majors. The researcher must choose a sampling method that will ensure that the sample provides good representation of the population. In this case, that means representation of all the majors. It doesn't mean that every major must be present in the sample, but your sample should nominally represent all the characteristics that make up all the majors, keeping in mind that there are likely will be some characteristics relevant to the study that are shared by multiple majors. Stratified sampling involves sampling from each category referred to as strata, in this case, college major. For this example, the researcher may choose to use a simple random sample within each category to select the individuals for the sample. Notice how we use two sampling techniques together, the stratification and a simple random sample. Also, while it often makes sense to select the same number of individuals from each stratum to compose our sample, it is not absolutely necessary to do so, and in some cases, it, makes, it doesn't even make sense to do that. Sometimes individuals are arranged in an ongoing process, like delivery of airport luggage from the plane to the baggage claim area, or like a line of people at a grocery checkout counter, or people waiting in line at the entrance to an event. The researchers may not know in such cases how many total individuals will travel through the system, and so they cannot necessarily see all the individuals at once. As you can imagine, it may not be practical in such cases to assign a random number to each individual. In continuous processes, sampling must take place on the fly while the process is running. In this case, the researcher might use systematic sampling. In sy systematic sampling, the researcher may select every, for example, every fourth person in line or select individuals at certain time intervals, like sampling fresh strawberries from a, a production line every 30 minutes for testing. Cluster sampling is a technique used to increase sampling efficiency. Consider a situation in which a researcher would like to interview a sample of 10,000 people from a city. The researcher may consider city blocks as clusters and then randomly select 1,000 city blocks. Next, the interviewers are sent to each of those chosen city blocks where they interview 10 people from each. The aspect of considering city blocks as a group is referred to as clustering. Beyond that, there are many variations. Choosing uh, the people for interviews within each city blocks can occur in multiple different ways. One way would be uh, to census every household on the block. Another way would be to randomly sample a certain number of houses within a block. The efficiency gain occurs because several people are being interviewed at the same location, a city block. It reduces the amount of traveling required for the interviewers as opposed to using a simple random sample to randomly select 10,000 individual houses in the city for in the inter interviewers to visit. So how do these sampling methods work together? One example is exit polls. Uh, so one year, I was heavily involved in an exit poll. The information that I share here comes from that experience. During the elections, an exit polling organization will send interviewers to individual polling places. They will interview voters as they exit the polls, which is why they call it the exit polls. Uh, they will ask the voters who or what they voted for, as well as demographic information about what the voter about the voters so they can try to predict 
the outcome of the election before the outcome is officially announced. They will also use statistics to provide commentary on common characteristics of voters who voted for certain candidates or ballot initiatives. Typically, there are far more polling places than there are interviewers. So researchers must determine how best to allocate interviewers to the polling places. They will typically use many layers of sampling methods together. So consider a state election with our uh, rectangular shaped state. Each state has multiple counties. Some counties are considered more influential or representative of the state than others. So perhaps because of including the state capital or uh, being heavily populated. Each county may have several polling places. Researchers may consider counties as clusters and will randomly select counties uh, to include in the exit poll. However, they may deviate from a true random sample of counties by ensuring that influential counties get included in the exit poll. So such a sampling uh, could be referred to as purposeful sampling. Once the target counties have been selected, researchers may designate or stratify certain areas within a county as urban or rural. Researchers may then randomly select a certain number of urban and rural strata, ensuring that influential areas of the counties are included. Once the strata within the counties have been selected, researchers may use a simple random sample to choose which polling places to send the interviewers to. Once the target polling places have been selected, intervie interviewers may use a systematic sample to select and poll every fourth person that exits the polling place. Consequently, an exit poll such as this may use cluster sampling, stratified sampling, systematic sampling, and simple random sampling with modifications where appropriate. The main thing to keep in mind is that researchers are trying to adequately and proportionally represent the voters in that state while making the best use of their limited resources of interviewers. They're trying to accurately predict the outcome of the elections so sending interviewers to a single county out of convenience would likely lead to inaccurate or biased results because they would only be representing the votes of that one county. Now here's an example uh, from my work in the agricultural industry. So soybeans are grown in many parts of the world. Soy is used in many products, including oils, animal feed, and even food for humans like soy milk, soy protein, and tofu. Often farmers take their soybeans to, in big trailers to grain elevators to sell their beans. Some grain elevators are located in shipping, in shipping ports so that their beans can be then shipped around the world. So this is a picture of trucks full of soybeans. I took this picture in, at a port in Rosario, Ar Argentina. These trucks are waiting in line to sell their beans at the grain elevator. Once they reach the front of the line, the operator at the grain elevator have to determine the value of the beans. They determine the value of the beans based on several features, including the overall condition of the beans, the amount of moisture they contain, uh, and, and so forth. Because the beans are sold by weight, the elevators don't want to pay extra for beans that are full of moisture because that extra cost is essentially just like paying for water. And so a trailer can hold a lot of, of soybeans. Often one trailer load contains beans from several different fields or from several different harvests. Beans from each harvest typically contain different moisture contents. As a result, the load in the trailer may contain several different uh, levels of moisture. 
the operators at the grain elevators need to determine the moisture level for the beans in the trailer accurately so they know how much to pay for them. However, they cannot spend more than five minutes to determine the moisture level because there is a long line of trucks waiting to have their, their beans uh, purchased. As an example, in November 2016, there were more than 46,000 truckloads of soybeans delivered to grain elevators in Rosario. The goal of sampling in this case is to collect a sample or a subset of the beans in the trailer and use that subset to represent all the beans in the trailer. Because different subsets of beans within the trailer may come from different fields or different harvests, the sample needs to come from multiple places within the trailer. To be representative of all beans in the trailer, the sample should be taken from locations throughout the trailer that are representative in all three dimensions, height, width, and depth. The grain elevator operators use a vacuum probe to sample the beans. The vacuum probe that's pictured here uh, has several inlets from which to suck the beans into the sample from multiple heights. The probe is inserted into the trailer at different locations of width and depth to obtain the representative sample. So here's a view from the top of the trailer. You can see that the vacuum probe has been submerged into the grain for uh, sampling. This video shows the probe in action collecting an actual sample. So hopefully you can see the inlets, they're opening and closing, they're making sure they're, they're not stuck. Then they submerge the probe into the trailer and it goes all the way to the bottom and then they open and close and then it's, you probably can't hear it, but it's vacuuming up uh, the seeds through those tubes into the sampling area. And then they lift it up and they again open and close the inlets to make sure they're clear and then they dip the probe into another part of the truck and they do that for uh, multiple locations within the truck. So because they have the inlets at the different heights, they can suck the beans in from the different heights uh, in the overall pile of beans that are inside the trailer. As with other practical examples, the grain sampling effort requires a combination of sampling techniques and does not necessarily follow textbook prescription for each of these methods. First, the trailer is divided up into sections from front to back as a form of stratification. But the operator does not sample from each of the strata. Instead, choosing somewhat haphazardly the location where the probe will be submerged into the grain. While it would be better for the locations within the trailer to have been chosen at random rather than haphazardly, that is a luxury not afforded to this current sampling operator. So he does his best uh, to simulate a random, a random selection. Had the locations been chosen at random, the sampling would have been simpler, similar to cluster sampling, with the locations being treated as clusters rather than as strata. One might also consider the probe inlets to resemble stratified sampling. With the different heights of the inlets sampling as if from strata. The time constraint put on the operators to complete the sampling and testing in about five minutes hinders a more careful or complex sampling of the grain from the trailers. Again, the main objective of sampling is to collect a sample that adequately represents the population. Here are some other thoughts to consider. First, haphazard is not the same as randomization. 
Randomization means that you use an actual random number generator or pseudo random number generator. Haphazard means that you don't. I have a lot of scientists tell me that they have selected a sample at random or applied individuals to treatments at random. And when I further ask them to explain uh, in detail how they collected their sample, it is clear that it was haphazardly chosen rather than randomly chosen. So why does that matter? Well, it matters because whether it is by humans or other experimental factors, bias can be introduced into the process that will skew the results. Independence is an assumption for many statistical analysis methods. Randomization simulates that independence and it helps us to satisfy the independence assumption. Second, uh, people often mistakenly believe that a larger population requires a larger sample, but that is not uh, strictly the case. The goal is to adequately represent the population. If we can adequately represent the population with 100 individuals, as, as well as with 1,000 individuals, then our sample size only needs to be 100. So that is the presentation that I have. Uh, here are the references for the, the soybeans and, and the video and the pictures. Um, and now I would like to open it up for questions. So um, somebody commented about the distinction between haphazard and random. Um, can, I can use this language with students and they haven't, they haven't heard the word haphazard before, so it was a big thank you, which that kind of struck me too when you were describing that. Um, that was awesome. Yes. Uh, <laughs> more times than not, if somebody says they collected something at random, yeah. they didn't collect it at random. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, your example was great. Um, are there any other questions? That was in the chat box, actually. I haven't seen anything come through in the question and answer box. So another aspect of it is, uh, like with the soybean sampling, um, the main thing to keep in mind is the overall objective. And if the overall objective is to collect a sample that represents the population, uh, sometimes the best way to get that done uh, doesn't follow all of the rules or it doesn't follow <laughs> rules in a specific way. And, and so uh, it, it's very eye-opening for someone to actually go through a sampling process and to see that some things work and some things don't work. And, and like with the grain elevator, they just don't have the time. I mean, they literally have five minutes right. to sample that entire truck. And so you, if that uh, operator had a, you know, you could probably imagine a way that they could come up with uh, a process for generating random locations, but it, it's for what they would, for the amount that they would benefit, it, it's not worth the, the effort to them. And so they, they won't do it that way. Right. So there's a cost benefit there. Yes. Right. Right. All right. Okay. There won't be really be a test. I kind of joked about that before we started recording. <laughs> if you have questions, please go ahead and put those in the, in the uh, question answer box. Oh, we got one now. Let's see. Um, any reference for exit poll sample? I'm not sure what that means. Uh, Do you, if you know it's, we're good. <laughs> so if there, if there's a reference to um, exactly how we came up with the exit poll or similar type uh, situations, I would suggest that there probably are. I don't have any offhand. Uh, okay. Like I said, when, when I was taking a college course on sampling, that was our big project is we actually did an exit poll for the entire state. And so we had, it was a very long uh, project and we had many, many people involved. And I think 
the statistics department developed the sampling plan, and then the political science department uh, actually went and, and collected the uh, polls. And, and so uh, this was my actual experience. Um, I would assume that the internet would probably have a, a few uh, specific examples that would show the details of, of what was used and, and what was the experience and how the outcome was for, for that exit poll. Right, and I think that this was about that as well. Did you have a report that you could share about that? I mean, I heard you say, you know, to look on the, to look it up. I yeah, think that's so it was about 30 years ago and okay. I, I, I don't have a report, but okay. Um, okay. I would assume that those are available. All right, here's another one. Um, what technologies do you recommend for creating random samples? I typically use Excel's random number generator, but sometimes it gives repeats. Any advice here? So you should, there should be an option in Excel for sampling without repeats. Uh, but I, sometimes I use Excel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the challenge is if you have uh, very complex uh, sampling procedures that you're working with, then you can still do it in Excel. It may just be a little bit more difficult to do. Um, but yes, Excel is a good example of a pseudo random number generator or any statistical software package um, would likewise be a, a pseudo random number generator and would give good results. Okay, is there anything else? I'm not seeing anything pop up. I open the chat too so I could see both. It's a tame crowd today. No more questions? Really? <laughs> it's possible, I guess. That's just how awesome you were. Let's see. Nope, I don't think I see anything else. Well, and it, it's not a very complicated topic <laughs> until, until you start working with it, and that's when the complications. Right, right. Come. So yeah. It's no. one of those things where you just have to dive in and do it to see right. how things go. Yeah, it was. It's super cool. Super cool. Well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take over then. Don't all leave yet. <laughs> we do have a little bit of um, AMATIC business to take care of. Let me sh go back and uh, go back to my slides and we can wrap up. Thank you so much for participating in today's AMATIC webinar. If you'd like to support future AMATIC webinars, please consider becoming a member of AMATIC. You can go to bit.ly slash join dash AMATIC. Uh, we are on social media, in particular, the um, American Mathematical Association of Tier Colleges has got a Facebook page, as well as all of our regions. So you're going to want to check that out and definitely join those regions. We have a VP in the house attending the webinar today. You're going to want to go ahead and join those um, Facebook groups. Recordings of past AMATIC webinars can be found at bit.ly slash AMATIC dash webinars. It usually takes us a week or two to produce and upload um, and they'll be in the archive. I will send you an email when that does occur. Um, if you could please take two minutes to evaluate the webinar content and the presenter, I would really appreciate it. You can either scan the uh, QR code that's on the bottom right of the screen, or you can uh, go to bit.ly slash amatic78. It is case sensitive, so make sure that that is all uh, lowercase. And I think I can put this in the chat for you. Bearing a copy paste fail. There we go. The direct link to the survey is inside the chat. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording, but I will remain um, here in the webinar. <laughs>